Every human's brain is a supercomputer, but every supercomputer is only as good as its programming. Did you know that your self-talk is your brain's programming? Why the madness? Why the barriers? Why me, Lord? Sounds familiar? Well, how about, I can't make it. I'm too poor, too uneducated, too old, too alone, weak, or ill-equipped to make a difference. Have these become your life commandments? Because a mother, father, girlfriend, boyfriend, spouse, teacher, employer said that's why they didn't want you? So you decided to make a lie your reality and comfort. Yes, a comfort. You've become so afraid of failing and rejection that you stopped trying to fly. He may never stand taller than three feet three inches, but Nick is fondly seen not only by his wife Kane and four children, but has also made his way into the hearts of millions as a philanthropist, social activist, author, evangelist, and speaker. Nicholas James Vujicic was born with Tetra Amelia Syndrome, a rare disorder characterized by the absence of legs and arms. Despite being born with seemingly less than, he chose to opt for the idea that everyone's plight is just as severe as his own, and the fight to determine his worth would not be determined by what he did not have, but by what he could put his efforts into to affect change in this world. Today, this Australian native figuratively stands tall with a net worth of over $800,000, but most importantly, loved by all who he has been able to embrace by his life's example. Does heaven, does God's presence or power seem too far away to make the change in your life that you need today? If this sounds like you, you've come to the right place. Today you'll discover, by joining us, that God has given you way more than you need to become the change maker this world needs by dissecting your life commandments. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Man, listen, I see in the chat that some of you all are talking about God's grace. It is nothing but God's grace. Come on, somebody. If you, if, if you are thankful for his grace, you are thankful for his mercy toward you. Listen, I need you to throw that in the chat. And I want you to understand that God's grace is greater than my sins. Do I got anybody? I got anybody in the chat today that understands that that God's grace is greater than my sin. D.N. Larry has said that God, his grace has brought me to this point in my life. Amen. Amen. That's the word. That's the word, y'all. God's grace. Listen, these life commandments that we're talking about is all because of God's grace. Listen, I'm hoping that you all going to see Jesus today. I hope that you're going to see God's grace today. If you are thankful for his grace, if you don't know where you would be without his grace, if you are thankful for how God has extended his grace, would you please talk to me in the chat today? I see you, Sister Tops, as you have said that I am thankful for God's for God's mercy and his grace toward me. Amen and amen and amen. Listen, y'all, as we're getting ready to get into the word today, I hope that you all came for a word from the Lord. Did you all come for a word from the Lord? There's a, there's a lot that is going on today, but listen, we are going to spend some time in God's word today, delving into what God has for us. And so we're talking about Life Commandments Part Number Three. Today, we're going to be focused on Commandments Number One and Two, and we're going to be talking about no other. We're simply no other. Uh, that, that, that's God's word, really, in two commandments, no other. And so why God says that to us, what the commandments say, and why God says that to us. Nordia said that well earlier, that it is important for us to understand why God said what he said. Because when you really understand God, I believe that you're going to love him all the more. And if you love God all the more, then you're going to obey him. Because Jesus says in John 14, 15, right? Right. That that um, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. But listen, y'all, 
This thing is so much deeper. Listen to me. This thing is so much deeper than just obedience. Like, you, you know, you know, we're so focused on just doing right. We're performers, right? It's one of the things that I talked about. And, and I don't know if everybody grasped it about why uh, that there is a need in my personal life to separate um, myself from what I do as a pastor. Some people say, oh, it's not a job. It is a job. It's, it's a job. It's ministry, right? And if you don't separate yourself from that, then you get caught up in what you do and what you don't do. And you begin to think highly of yourself when you do well. So when, 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 if I preach a great sermon and all of you all send me, you know, these, these, these great remarks, then I feel great about myself because I, that's what I'm tying my personhood to, right? If, if, if it bombs and if it doesn't go so well, then I now feel bad about myself, right? About myself, right? Because it didn't go well. And we want to get beyond just performing, y'all, because there is a reason. Listen, these commandments that God have given us are not just for performance. We're going to see that today. These commandments are to give you life. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 24, that if you keep these commandments, the reason God says that I have given you these commandments is to preserve you alive. How many of y'all want to live? God says that I have given you my laws and my commandments to actually give you life. So when you do it, you are actually helping out your own self. Anybody want life today? And so listen, I want to get right into the word. I was going to tell you that as I start, um, a lot of times I will repeat things that I said before. And I gave this illustration yesterday. When I was in high school, when I was in the 12th grade, a senior, I took a class called Advanced Place um, Calculus. And calculus has a lot to do with um, derivatives and it has to do with integrals, right? And it's a branch of mathematics that's high and it's relatively complicated. You don't end up taking calculus, though, without taking Algebra 1 and Algebra 2. You don't take calculus if you haven't taken geometry. You don't take calculus if you haven't taken trigonometry, meaning you need to have some things established, right, before you get to here, right? And so often what we have done, particularly as it has related to God's law, we've just come and we just give it to you. We just come and we just say, here's the law, here's the commandments, here's what you need to do, here's this, this, this is what you need to be doing, this is what God requires of you, and so forth and so on. And yet we have no background and no foundation to that. And so when it falls apart that my performance is not working or I really don't have the desire, because y'all, if you just real about it, some of us really don't desire to do what God says like that, y'all. We don't really desire to obey God like that or it gets old and it just is not working and the results are not coming, particularly Right. If you're trying to do what God tells you to do and then that thing ends up on the back end with persecution and rejection and, and, and you ain't seeing no benefit from it. And, and you still got more bills than you got money and, 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 and you lose your job and all of these different type of things. You still get sick and you still trying to serve God. The bottom will fall out of that thing if you're only just trying to say, I'm going to obey. Oh, that's all I'm going to do. I'm just going to try to obey. Meaning that obedience cannot be the motive. Your obedience must flow from love. And I believe that the better that we understand God is the more that we will love God and we will obey him automatically. I'll talk more about that in the message. But listen, y'all, I want to get into the word today and I want to draw your attention to our text today. I want to go to Exodus chapter 20 and I want to look at verses one through six. Exodus chapter 20. If you would follow me there, Exodus chapter 20. And I want to look at verses one through six. Exodus chapter 20. And I want to look at verses one through six. Here's what the word of the Lord said says, and God spoke all of these words saying, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. Mm -hmm. Verse number three says, you shall have no other gods before me. Note that. 
Verse number four, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Mm. I want you to think about that. I want to think about why God said that. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquities of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Verse number uh, six, but showing mercy, listen now, showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me. Come on and keep my commandments. Listen, we just want to simply talk on the subject today of no other. Let's pray together. Father, I ask in the name of Jesus that you would breathe on the word and that you would give it life today is our prayer in Jesus name and for his name's sake, we say together, amen and amen and amen. Listen, y'all, um, last week, the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about this thing called life commandments. We've been talking about life commandments. And as we look at life commandments, the John Savage in his book, uh, Listening and Caring Skills says that life commandments are deep inner belief systems that act as our internal guidance for your mind. And it also influences the way that we live. Um, the, the, these life commandments are the GPS for how you move in life. And I want you to understand that, that, that it causes us to ask ourselves the questions. If we have life commandments, why do we believe what we believe? Why do we believe what we believe about ourselves? Why do we believe what we believe about life? Why do we believe what we believe about the world? Why do we believe what we believe about God? And what I'm suggesting to you and what Savage has suggested to us uh, in our study is that the commandments that we have are not just beliefs that we have come up on on our own. So remember, I talked to you that there are ways in which we receive life commandments kinesthetically through environment. We receive life commandments verbally through that which was said to us. We receive life commandments through inferences, things that we have heard, um, and then we interpret it a certain way. We receive life commandments through the behaviors of individuals and that we have also interpreted a certain way. And y'all, the reason that this is important and the reason why I'm sitting here and I'm talking about this thing is because I want you to understand that Savage says that our deep internal belief systems ultimately affect our religious belief systems. Y'all, I, I want to say that one more time. Our deep internal belief systems ultimately affect our religious belief systems. So for those of us that believe that what I believe about myself uh, what I believe about the world has no impact upon what I believe about God. You got a whole nother thing coming. And I want you to understand that, that what your life experience has been, has all the world to do with how you see God, how you relate to God, if you will obey God ultimately, and if you will be saved. This thing right here, these life commandments literally is life and death. And I want you to understand that my life commandments don't just affect how I view God, but it affects how I relate to scripture. It affects my religious habits, what I choose to do and what I choose not to do. It also affects my religious language. So let me go there with you. It's possible that if we struggle with God being our father, it is because we possibly have some daddy issues or our daddy was completely absent from our lives. It's possible that if we see God as vengeful, if we see God as punitive, if we see God as vindictive, it is probably because we've had some traumatic experiences in our lives of abandonment, rejection, and disapproval. If you are fixated on you're going to go to hell and you're going to burn throughout eternity, 
If you spend your time thinking every time you make a mistake that you're out of favor with God and your relationship has been cut off, it's probably because you've had one of these experiences. And it's possible that I will struggle with the concept that God wants me, all this stuff I've been talking about, that God loves me, that God accepts me unconditionally, and that he makes this initiation. And I know that some of you are sitting here, and when you hear it, the first thought in your mind is you might be skeptical. What's the catch, right? But on the other side of this thing, if we have experienced love, and acceptance and inclusion when we were growing up. If our homes were loving, if they were peaceful, if they were happy, if we had good relationships with our parents, but y'all particularly with our fathers, then it makes it far easier to see God as a loving heavenly father who sees me and wants me. Why? Because I don't see God. God for me is seen many times through my parents and those that are around me. I haven't seen God. I haven't heard God's voice. Uh, 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 many times I've, I've, I've never been able to lay eyes on him or wrap my eyes around him. So I'm reliant on the relationships that I have. And really most of what we understand about God as we relate to him as a personality, as we relate to him as a person really has to do with what our experiences have been with other people. Let me take it a little bit farther. If I grew up as a winner, then it would be easier for me to believe that my name is victory and that I am more than a conqueror. And this stuff is starting to make sense to me now, y'all, because I talk, I, you, you know, you, you sit here and you preach about victory. You sit here and you talk about conquering and, and you, you preach this stuff with power and people shout with you. They wave their hands with you. They jump up and down with you. But then when you meet them in the office or you talk to them on the side someplace, they're holding their heads down and they can't believe that they can do it. Why? Because a sermon is not enough to rewire your life. A sermon is not enough to rewire your thinking. It's all based on what my experiences have been. And understand that if I grew up being told that I was a loser, that I would not amount to anything, that I'm not, that I'm not very likely to embrace God seeing me as a winner. And if you're listening to this this morning, just 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 put yourself, you know, you, you can tell in the chat if you want to. I'm a winner. I see myself as a winner. I see myself as a loser. I'm going to get this thing done. Right. I mean, I really just believe at the end of the day for my life that things will win, that will work out. I mean, I can have this self-talk with my own self to believe, right, that things will come together. I can have that positive self-talk. But I think it helped that my parents gave me positive self-talk as well. Are you listening to me? That I had a grandmama that believed in me. I had a daddy and a mama who believed in me. I had other people who were around me who affirmed me a lot that gave me confidence even to sit here today. I want you to understand that if I was told that I am a loser, that I am nothing, I am more likely then not to be a winner but I'm more likely to self-sabotage, meaning when I'm on the verge of the cusp of success, I do something to sabotage that or cause that thing to happen because, right, I don't think I can do it. Or I attempt little because I see myself as little. And listen, y'all, here's what I want you to understand. Like one member told me this week as I was talking to them about this sermon series they said, you know what? We tend to relate to God the way others have related to us. Mm. I, 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 want, I want that thing to, 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 to just settle in for a moment. That many times we relate to God the way that others have related to us. Meaning that if others related to us negative, negatively, then we tend to relate to God negatively. If our experiences are pretty much positive, then we tend to relate to God positively. So, so Savage in his book, in chapter 10, he tells the story of a man that he interviewed who was on the, uh, the edge of burnout. And he was serving as a pastor in a 1,200 member church. 
And, and, and he, he found out that, that when, when he was given this assignment, that this was a promotion for him because he had come from about a 700 member church. So 500 more members was a step up for him. And when he was in the smaller of his two churches, uh, he was able to keep a commandment that he had learned as a little child. And it was simply this, be a good boy and try to make everybody like you. Now that was okay when he was a little boy, right? Cause you can probably do that within your circle of friends, but yet he grows up now and this life commandment does not work as well as an adult. And it's not going to work well as a pastor. And it's surely not going to work well in the uh, pastoring 1,200 people. Because now the pastor is in a setting where he can't make everyone happy. Thus, when someone from his congregation is angry with him because he is not a good boy, he goes a little crazy inside because he's not living up to his law of life. And here's the thing. If this pastor, Savage says, doesn't change this life commandment, then every time somebody disagrees with him, every time somebody is angry with him, every time somebody gets upset with him, he is going to lose his mind and lose it or probably even burn out because there is no way that he can make the expectations for everybody. Y'all, what I'm saying to you as an example, just like with this pastor, there are some life commandments that we just must break because they serve their purpose for a time. They worked when we were children. They may have worked when we were teenagers, but as we become older, Life changes, situations changes, and now these life commandments must become transitory because if they don't transition in our lives, listen to me now, they become destructive and they become paralyzing. What do you mean by that, Pastor? That means that these life commandments that we have, they will lead you to self-sabotage. Your wrong life commandments will lead you to the wrong career paths. The wrong life commandments will lead you to the wrong life choices. It will lead you to the wrong life might mate or partner. It will lead you to an unproductive life. It will lead you to not accomplishing your life purpose. And most importantly, it will lead you to not intimately connecting with God. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I want you to understand and hear me now. That these limits, though, the, the, these, these self-destructive life commandments that we have now, I want you to hear me because this is this here's, here's where the shout comes. The, 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 these paralyzing love, uh, uh, life commandments are not externally imposed. You're not listening to me. You're not listening to me. This is not happening from the outside. Because the behaviors, the inference, the, 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 the environment, all of those things that are happening around you are things that we have chosen to take on and they are self-imposed. Listen to this, y'all. Uh, John Savage says in his book that the only limits that we have on us is what we are. Uh, the only limits that we have on what we can do is what we believe we can do. Mm. I want to say that again. The only limits we have on what we can do is what we believe we can do. Meaning the, 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 the sky can be the limit for you to be an author, to be a judge, to be a doctor, to be a lawyer. L listen, listen to me, particularly my children, my, my children, come on up in here. The only limits are the limits that you place on yourself. As we saw with Nick, as we saw with Les Brown on last week, as we've been watching the videos that have been put together by our tech team, and we see these individuals breaking through, as we see Roger Bannister, who, who breaks the, the, the four-minute uh, mile, where all of these things happen because they told themselves that it was possible to do it. Nick is saying to himself, because I have no arms and no legs doesn't mean that I can't travel the world and be a speaker. Doesn't mean that I can't write books. 
doesn't mean that I can't be successful. Doesn't mean that I can't impact the lives of others. Who says that I have to have these limitations? Who says that I can't do it? I'm the only one telling myself that I can't do it. So how do we break these bad life commandments that are imposed on, uh, imposed upon, uh, um, imposed upon us by others and by the devil himself? How do we turn our lives around? Mm. I want to give you the, the same answer that Savage gave his 10th grade teacher after she asked him at the end of a conference that he was speaking at, how did you turn your life around? Because when this man who wrote this book was in the 10th grade, he wasn't doing well, wasn't getting good grades, wasn't excelling at all because he didn't feel good about himself. And now this man is teaching others how to turn their lives around and how to eliminate bad life commandments. And he could have given a whole litany of answers, but he only gave one. He gave one word, y'all. And his one word to his 10th grade teacher was simply God. Mm. What I want you to understand is, is that to reshape our thinking, to, to have a new life commandment, um, to, have a, 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 to have a new life, to have abundant life, we need what Savage calls a different inner law to guide us. Ooh, mercy. I want y'all to listen to me. To have a new life, to have to reshake or rewire our thinking, to have abundant life, we need a different inner law to guide us. And I believe that inner law to be God's writing of his commandments on our hearts. Now, I, I, I know that that might sound too simple, y'all, but I think it has a lot to do with the inner law because I'm going someplace with this. Follow me now. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter eight and verse 10, God says, I will do what? I will put my laws in their what? Mind. And I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. God says, I'm going to actually take my law and I'm going to write it on your mind and I'm going to write it in your heart. Now, this inner law that we're talking about is the same law that God gave on tablets of stone to Israel. But what God is saying here in this text is now the law is not on tablets of stone, but now the law is being internalized. And y'all, this is what I'm trying to share with you. I believe that if we can understand what God's intention was for Israel and why he said what he said and why he wanted us to do what he wanted us to do, then we can practically apply this new inner law to our lives. In fact, God's intention was is that the law would be so written inside of us, so ingrained in us, it would become a part of our ge genetic code. It would become a part of our mindset. It would be the way that we would live, the way that we would move. It would be our automatic guiding principles. What God is saying is that I want to rewire your life commandments. I want to take away all the stuff that other people have told you. I want to change what mama and daddy has said. I want to change what pastor might have said. I want to change what others have put into your spirit. And I want to give you the commandments that will allow you to live a life and live it to its fullest abundance. But I also want you to come to an understanding of me because I want you to understand that if we can understand God and if we can do away with some of these life commandments, if we can do away with some of the crazy theology and the ideas that we have about God and about scripture as a result of what we believe, if we can see God's perspective, then we can embrace God's inner life commandments. But y'all, I want to say this to you, and I want you to listen to me very carefully. I, I, I want you to understand where, where, where I'm going with this thing right here. I need you to settle in. If you're going to be able to understand what God has for you, if you're going to be able to understand what his life commandments are, 
You, you're going to really have to spend some time with him. Uh, you're really going to have to get away and retreat with him. Uh, um, you, you're going to have to stop just listening to Pastor Eichner preach. Now, I'm not saying don't listen to me, but you got to do more than just listen to the sermon on Sabbath. You got to do more than just listen to, to the words of other people. But you've got to get down in the word of God for yourself. God needs to have an encounter with you so that he may be able to rewire you. Y'all, how do I know this? Because now we go to Exodus chapter 19, and this is based on what I told you last week. Now we're building the foundation for where we're going, right? God needed to get with his people. He needed to have some quiet time with them to be able to rewire them. He needed to have some time to be able to change them. And that's why he brought them out to this place called Sinai this mountainous arena, this remote place, this spot, so that he could give his people rest and recovery or who had experienced much trauma over the years. And y'all, listen, we talking about we got trauma in our lives. Can you feel the children of Israel now? The children of Israel have been enslaved for 430 years. Come on now. You got to understand that the children of Israel have known nothing but slavery and bondage and inhumane treatment and the abuse of power. And so I, the, 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 the people have been used to, been conditioned to not thinking for themselves, but only listening to the Pharaoh. They've been conditioned to now only listening to their taskmasters, because if they were if they did not listen, then they were going to be whipped or they were going to be beaten. And so because they didn't want to suffer punishment, many of them would not rebel. They would just go along with. God says, I've got to get you to the point where your mind begins to work again. Oh, you're not listening to me. You're not listening to me. Listen, we've got the same thing in our history, y'all, because as we are on the, the verge of celebrating black history and we look at our history and we remember what our forefathers fathers have been through. Listen, y'all, they came through on the middle passage, right? Listen, y'all, they, they were chained and treated like animals, right? Listen, y'all, they, 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 were, they were beaten by, by, their, by their slave owners and mistreated, right? Uh, listen, listen y'all, many of us during the civil rights movement, uh, movement, many of our forefathers were burned to death and, and lynched. And, and as others saw these experiences, many of them were willing to say, yes, sir. Many of them were, were willing to go ahead and just say, yes, ma'am, because they didn't want to have that type of experience. And as a result, their minds were locked, right? Where they were not thinking for themselves. Mm. Can I tell you right now that from some of our life experiences, some of the ways that we've been talked to, the way that we have been molested and abused through the years, mm, we've got that same kind of thing that we're not thinking for ourselves. Be careful, y'all. Be careful because what God wanted to do is he wanted to bring his people out into the wilderness so that he could rewire their minds so that they would begin to think because he wanted to have an experience with them. But y'all, that ain't it. It's not just that they that they that they weren't thinking for themselves and that they had been in slavery. But I want you to think about what they had been around for all of these years. For the last 430 years, generation after generation, they had been set surrounded by paganism and idolatry. And, and they knew something about who God was, but it was limited because they had been stripped of their culture, stripped of their civilization, and even stripped of their faith. So when by the time they get to Mount Sinai, God says that I want to do a reset. And I want you all to listen to me very carefully. When God brings them out to this isolated region, God does that because he, he's calling them into a special relationship with him. God is not calling for him to be a dictator. God is not calling for him to just do all the talking. God is calling them to a place where he can 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 talk to them. So he needed to bring them away from all the sights and sounds of Egypt. He needed to bring them away from all of the surrounding nations. And y'all, I want to go back to this a moment because I want you to understand as God brought Israel 
out in the middle of nothing and surrounded them by mountains and they could only focus on him. I want you to understand that God brings us to some barren places. God brings us to some seemingly unfruitful moments. God brings us to some quiet moments that he will cause us to stop because he will pour into us so that he can pour into us. I want you to understand that there needs to be some moments so that God can rewire our thinking. God needs to have some moments that he can undo some life commandments. God needs some moments where he can get us away from the hustle and the bustle of life that he can focus in on us so that he can change our thinking. What I'm saying to you is God says that there are some moments that you need to turn off social media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are moments that we need to stop scrolling on this thing. We need to get off of TikTok and get off of Facebook and get off of YouTube and because sometimes we're just endlessly scrolling. But God says, these are moments that I would love to talk to you, but you can't hear me because you're in needless uh, 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 communication or media time and you can't hear my voice. There are times, y'all, that we need to turn off our televisions. There are times, y'all, that we need to get away from the people. There are times that we need to let Boo Boo and Shaniqua and Ray Ray go. There are times that we need to detach <laughs> so that we can attach to him. It was here in Sinai, in this mountainous region, that God would re reveal himself. And, and like I told you, that this, this was an awing and overwhelming and downright scary experience, right? And, and, and God reveals himself, y'all, y'all in this, 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 this way. I want you to understand that, that, that God shows up in great pomp and circumstance. This is the type of God that we are most afraid of. And you can show enough bet that Israel was afraid. Because God says to Moses, listen, here's what I want you to do. You're going to go have the people wash their clothes, purify themselves. Men, don't have sex with your wives. Don't touch them. Everybody stay away from each other. Um, I want you to fast. I want you to pray and prepare yourself for this moment. I want you to put a, a, a some, some boundaries or some obstacles around. I want you to section off and close the mountain. Because if anybody comes to the mountain, right, they're going to die. Now, 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 now this, this, this thing, this thing is serious, y'all. God says if they even touch the mountain, they're going to die. God is serious because God is getting ready to show up. And y'all, here's what I want to listen. I want you to listen to, because a lot of times when you read Exodus 19, you can hear about the thundering and the lightning. And the word says that the trumpet was supposed to blow long. And when the trumpet stopped, you know, then God would speak and so forth and so on. There was this great darkness, the Bible says, that enveloped the mountain of Sinai. And this awful, awful grandeur of God shows up. But y'all, while we so caught up in the thundering and lightning and it being scary, here is what I do want you to recognize. Mm -hmm. Not how God showed up, but that he showed up. Oh, my goodness. Listen to me. God says, I am going to come and show up in person among my own people. I am coming to be with them. Yes, this moment is serious. Yes, this moment is solemn. Yes, this moment is important. Yes, I expect you to do. I'm not coming to play with you, but I want you to understand that I am showing up myself. I'm not sending a representative. I'm not talking in behalf of Moses. I'm not sending another prophet. I am showing up myself in darkness. And the word says in Deuteronomy that God showed up. And not only did he he come, but he came with myriads of angels and God opened his, his mouth and he began to speak. And y'all, here is the life commandment I want you to understand. God wants to be in relationship with you. These Israelites were jacked up. They were messed up. They had lost their culture. They were wishy-washy. Every time something went wrong, take us back to Egypt, take us back to Egypt, give us the flesh pots. But God says, I just keep hanging in there with you. I want to be in relationship with you. And as messed up and as jacked up as they were, there was God showing up among his people. Y'all, y'all not listening to me. It's like when God says in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 11 that God was not ashamed to call them brethren. Yeah. 
God is not ashamed of you. This is the life commandment. Some of you all are carrying shame right now. Some of you are carrying embarrassment from your past. Some of you are carrying hurt and frustration. Some of you have been ostracized and outcast. And, and you have believed that that's how God treats you. But I want you to understand that the word of God says that he's not ashamed of you. Come on. He's not ashamed of your past. He's not ashamed of your bondage. He's not ashamed of, of the things that you've been through. He's not ashamed of your bad experience. He's not ashamed of the things that have happened to you. He's not ashamed of who you are, even in the moments that you have embarrassed him. Y'all, come on, because some of y'all didn't want God. Some of you talked against God's name. Some of you blasphemed God. Some of you mistreated God. Some of you turned your back on God. Others of you were disobedient to God. Wouldn't do what God says, but he says, I'm not ashamed of you. Hallelujah. And so God, he comes to this broken people, idolatrous, pagan, not active people and he says to them I'm going to show up myself oh y'all ain't listening to me y'all ain't listening to me God always wants to show up. Oh, I can tell you how he shows up. When Adam fell into sin, God showed up in the Garden of Eden. Hallelujah. I want you to understand when God was separated from Israel, he built himself a sanctuary. Exodus 25 and verse 8, that I might dwell among my people. He showed up. When he was given the Ten Commandments, he showed up. And when it was time for the world to be redeemed, he didn't send an angel. He sent his own son, Jesus Christ. And he showed up. His name shall be called Emmanuel because God is with us. And when all this thing is said and done, y'all, the word says that in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4, the word of the Lord says, right? that behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. God showed up. I will wipe every tear away from their eyes. There will be no more sorrow, no devil, more death or pain for the former things are passed away. Verse number five, because God will be with his people and his people shall be with him and they will be one. Listen, y'all, what I want you to understand in order you just said it, come on. He show, if he showed up, to save me from sin, then he's going to show up in the midst of my problems. He's going to show up in the midst of my hurt. He's going to show up on my job when I need him. He's going to show up at school, young people, when you need him on that test. He's going to show up in your moments of despair. He's going to show up in the midnight hour. God will show up. And he showed up on this mountain, y'all. And the reason why he showed up is because he wanted to be in relationship. I want you to digest that and embrace that today. Mm, mm, mm. Listen to me now. God's words to Israel that, that, that I, I, he says in Exodus 20 verses one and two, he says, I give you these commandments because I am your God and I am your deliverer. Mm -hmm. Listen to me. I am well, where's, where's, where's my, where's my text here? I am your God and I am your deliverer. And God says on the basis of being your God, this thing is, is personal. There it is. Put that up texting for me on the basis. He didn't say I am. Listen, y'all. He did not say, he didn't say I am the Lord. He didn't say because I am God. She said, because I am your God, right? Because I am your God and I am your deliverer. And on the basis of being your God and setting you free from slavery in, 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 and setting you free from death, I give you these commandments. Mm -hmm. The first thing that God says in Exodus chapter 20 and verse three, next, the next thing he says is you shall have no other gods before me. Now that text that I just had, I'm going back to it again because I am your God personal because I am your deliverer personal. 
you won't have any of the gods before me. Mm -hmm. well, one commentary says that this commandment is not as much a prohibition as it is an enabling promise. Mm. What God says, when you realize that I am your God, I belong to you, I, I am in relationship with you. When you understand what I have done for you, the natural result will be that you won't have any other gods before me. I want you to let that settle in because what we have only treated it as just don't do it. But God says you will not want to do it because of what I have done for you. And what I want you to understand here is that the importance of this life commandment that God is saying here, it's on the basis of not what you ask me to do. But it's on the basis of what I initiated all by myself because you didn't ask me to. Well, the people were crying out for deliverance, but I was the one that came along and delivered you from Egypt. Right. And as a result of that, you will not have any other gods before me. Now, I want you to understand that God needed to share this word with the people because Israel's past had them coming out of a culture in Egypt that was steeped in polytheistic worship. Polytheism just simply means the worship of many gods. That's what Egypt did. And yet, listen, listen, y'all, they're in the middle. They're coming out of that culture, but yet their future would have them entering into another civilization in the Canaan land that was also immersed in polytheism. So God says, I need to deal with your past, Hmm. But I also need to prepare you for your future. Oh, Y'all like, <laughs> like, listen to me. God says, I give you the commandments to help rid you of your past, but to also prepare you for your future. Can I help you to understand that when God is working in your life, y'all, I need you to understand that God has one foot when he's in the present. But he's got one foot in the past where he's healing you. And while he's healing you of your past, he's also preparing you for your future. Oh, y'all ain't listening to me in this. And so God was there with Israel and he was ridding them of, of, of as the psychologist says, the shell of lies that they had received as truth. They had believed that all of these other gods were true. But God was saying that I am the only true and living God. The true and living God is the one that delivered you from bondage. The true and living God is the one who brought you across the Red Sea. The true and living God is the one who made a highway in the midst of waters and then destroyed the Pharaoh and his armies by closing those same waters. It was the true and living God that kept them cool in the desert by a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. It was the true and living God that fed them manna in the wilderness and provided for them. And now it was the true and living God that now stood on the top of Mount Sinai with the angelic host and made himself real and known to his people. God himself was the one that spoke to them to differentiate himself from all of these other gods. God gave him gave evidence that he was the true and living God. And it was on this this basis, come on, and this basis alone, based on what God had done that he was to be worshiped. God says, if we're going to be in relationship, here are the rules to the relationship. If we're going to be in relationship, here are the boundaries that will govern his relationship with his people that I will not share worship with any other simply because there is no other God, y'all. I am the only one. Listen, I want you to understand that the, the surrounding nations of this time were creating other gods and they had learned to not only just make gods, but they were worshiping nature and they were also worshiping themselves. But God says, because I am God, I must be number one and everything else must be second. You are not to worship things. You are not to worship nature and you are not to worship yourself. You know, on last week, I, I talked to you um, about um, Dr. Martin Luther King 
And on February the 4th, 1968, at the Ebenezer Baptist Church, he preached a sermon entitled The Drum Major Instinct. And the idea for the sermon came from a previous sermon that was um, that had been preached by a well-known white Methodist um, preacher by the name of J. Wallace Hamilton. And in this sermon, King used the story uh, of, of, P of James and John's mother who would ask a strange thing, right? But probably was the question on everybody's, not, on everybody's mind. Uh, uh, she asked for her sons to be able to sit on the right and the left of him in the kingdom. And King noted that the core problem for James and John is, is, is not that they just uh, uh, desired great stuff, but they desired to be out front and they had a desire to lead the parade. King says that this drum major instinct is what leads to the idea of superiority, that some are better than others. The whole idea that white skin was ordained for them to be first. This drum major instinct is, 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 the, is the, the root to what he says is the most of the race problem that exists in our world today. So when Jesus came along, his response to James and John's mother and to them was that greatness comes for humility of service. And what King said that Jesus said, in, in, in essence, Jesus was reordering their priorities. Mm -hmm. I want you to understand that that's exactly what God was doing with the first commandment. Because he was saying, because I am your God, because I have delivered you. Some of you all in here know what I'm talking about. Uh, because I have brought you out of darkness and I have brought you into the marvelous light. Because I have saved your life from eternal death. Because I have protected you. Because I have provided for you. You are not to have anything before me. I need you to reprioritize your priorities. I need you to reorder your priorities in your life. I'm telling you, don't worry about putting yourself first. Stop striving to try to be the greatest. Stop striving. Well, I... Stop striving to try to be the greatest at the expense of somebody else. Stop striving um, um, to, 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 to put others down so that you can be great. Stop putting so much focus on yourself. That's what God is really saying here. He says, make me your priority and take your eyes off of you. You must become second. Stop focusing on what you desire and your dreams and your goals and your ambitions and what I want to do with my career and how I want to live my life and how people don't cater toward me and how people don't like me or how I hold my head down and I think so lowly of myself. God is simply saying, take your eyes off of yourself because if you think yourself too great, then you might be making yourself first and making me second. And if you think too low of yourself, you might be spending too much time thinking thinking about you, focused on you, and I'm still second in your life. Don't worship yourself. Don't worship humanity. Don't worship things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Listen, I want you to understand, y'all, that this is so important because in the last days, the message that is given to us is that with a loud voice, Revelation chapter 14 and verse 7, the first angel's message says, fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and who made the earth and who made the sea and who made the springs of water. Paul says in Romans chapter one that in these last days, that one of the things that we would end up seeing is that people who are wise would become fools, right? They would change the glory of the incorruptible God and make him into an image. They will worship birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. But, but in verse number 25 of Romans chapter one, this is what God says, that, the pe that, that people in the last days would exchange the truth of God for the lie. The truth of God for the lie and would worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Y'all, God is saying, don't put anything before me. Don't set anything over me. Make sure that I am your priority. Priority in your love. Priority in your relationships. 
priority in your duties, priority in your life, and everything that you do, make me center, make me first, put nothing before me. Because if you don't, it won't result in life. It will result in death. Nordy and I last night were, were, were um, um, reading about Abraham and Lot. And both of these men were rich and prosperous. And they just had too much stuff in between them. They, 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 they could not exist together. So they needed to go their separate ways. Abraham gave Lot the first choice. And really in that culture, in Oriental culture, Lot should have said, no, you, Abraham, you take the choice because you're, you're older than me. That's just the way that it worked. But Lot, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 13 and verse 11, he looked to the plain of Jordan and he decided that that is where he was going to settle, y'all. Listen to me very carefully. He never asked Abraham. He just goes ahead and takes his land. But more importantly than asking Abraham, he never asked God. He never checked in with God. He never he he never said, Lord, is this OK? He looked at this place and he said, it's beautiful. Mm. It's got all of the resources. It's got everything that I need. It's a place. It's a booming city. It's got plenty of, of, of stores. It's got plenty of malls. It's got plenty of shopping areas. Right. It, it's it, it's got the, the technology is great there. It, it's one of the cities that's on the rise. And yet he decides to move to Jordan which causes him to pitch towards Sodom. Eventually, Lot moves from Sodom and he pitches his tent right in, in, in Sodom and Gomorrah. And y'all in the end, because he didn't ask God, when God says it's time to get out, he hesitates. He loses most of the stuff he worked for in his life. He lost his daughters. He lost his son-in-laws. He ended up losing his wife because he wanted this thing more than he wanted God. It cost him almost everything except his own life. And the two daughters that came out with him, they were so emotionally and mentally traumatized that they got their father drunk, had sex with him, ended up having children. And that's how we had the Moabites and Ammonites, all because, and the word says that Lot was a righteous man, Lord have mercy. So if you're talking about Lot being a righteous man, what to the rest of us, y'all? What to the rest of us, y'all? The second commandment is kind of right in harmony with that. The second commandment is, 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 is right along with that. God says, look, don't make no graven images unto me, right? Don't, don't create anything that would be... Um, the, the, the center of your worship. Um, the text says, if you, if you look at it with me, he says, you shall not make yourself, verse four, a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or is in the earth beneath or is that in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers until the children of the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me, and keep my commandments. Listen, God, again, in many ways, is just simply saying, don't have anything before me. But why does God need to say that to his people? Listen, because the Israelites were coming out of Egypt and the Egyptian culture said that they followed the activities that had been written and inscribed on tombs and images and statues. These folk believe that there was an afterlife. And so they, 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 they would build these pyramids and they would put uh, horses and food and all that stuff so that the people could cross the sticks and move on to the afterlife. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the Israelites had been exposed to this and had a warped thinking about the afterlife. When Jesus says, don't, when, 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 when the word of God says, don't worship anything in heaven above. Mm. The, the Egyptians had been worshiping the sun and the moon. In fact, that's why when Moses makes his account and he writes out the order of the days, he never says that God created the sun and the moon, because if he did, there was a fear that the people of Israel would worship the sun, the moon and the stars. Mm. And, and, and God says, don't worship anything beneath. Right. 
the animals and the trees, nature was worshiped, right? By the Egyptians, that's beneath the earth. And then he says, even anything that is underneath the earth, right? The reason why, why God says that is because the Egyptians worshiped the Nile water that was beneath the waters of the earth. And, and all of these things, the, the animals and the trees and, and the sun, the moon and the stars and the water, all of these things came to the point of trivializing who God is. And God was now being reduced to an object. And God says, I am not an object. Don't make anything to represent me. Don't worship me. Don't worship anything that is set up in my name. Worship me only as the true and living God. Do not be caught up in adultery because it takes away from your relationship with me, y'all. God says, I want to take you away from the things that are death. Y'all, at the end of time, if you look at the seven last plagues that are poured out, all of the plagues are based on things that God, that people in the earth worshipped. And it now turns on them. God says, I know these things will turn on you. These things don't contain life. They contain death. Listen, y'all, the same thing is true for us. We live in an idolatrous world. We, we are caught up in idolatry. Listen, the story is told of a wealthy man one day who was driving his BMW and he had an accident, a very bad accident. And the car was totaled. And a policeman came on the scene and got the man out of the car. And as the man came to him, he said, my BMW, oh, my BMW. The police officer said to him, sir, I'm sorry, but you don't have time to worry about your BMW. It's just a car. We've got to rush you to the hospital because your heart, your arm has been severed at the elbow. The wealthy man then began to exclaim, oh, my Rolex. Oh, my Rolex. This man's arm had been severed and he was concerned about his Rolex watch. He had his priorities mixed up, y'all. That's what God is saying to us. Get your priorities right. Put things in harmony with where they should be. Listen, we're not idolatrous people, right? We don't have, we don't worship animals and food and sun, moon, and stars but we worship entertainers. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We worship sports figures. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We worship our sports teams. You know, just look at people. Fans, the word fans is short for fanatics, folks. We will do anything. We won't come church. Some of us won't come church, but we'll go outside in the cold. Some people take their clothes off, right? They'll scream and holler. For people running around with a football, for real, for real. Some of us have made our sports teams. Some of us have made our entertainers. Some of us have made our movie stars. Some of us have made our favorite shows. Whatever we watch on Netflix, whatever we, some of us have made social media, y'all. It is our God. And God says, do not worship these false gods. You live in an idolatrous world and I want to deliver you from these things. Get your priorities straight. Have nothing before me. Worship is to be given to me and to me only. In closing, Tony Evans, Dr. Tony Evans tells the story that he was once flying from Atlanta back to Dallas and he had to catch flight number 74. And as he was getting ready to catch this flight um, in Atlanta, there was this famous soul food place called Pascal's. And this place is famous for its fried chicken. And uh, Pascal's has a whole lot of booths in the Atlanta airport. So Dr. Evans says that as he was at the airport waiting on his flight, the smell from Pascal's just began to call his name. <laughs> so he went over and he ordered himself two chicken thighs and a biscuit. And just as he was getting ready to sit down and to eat his chicken and his biscuit, 
he heard the last call for his flight. Flight number 74 to Dallas. Flight number 74 to Dallas. Now she was in a dilemma. Mm -hmm. He had gotten his piping hot chicken from Pascal's that was calling his name. But flight number 74 was also calling his name. Both of them were screaming in his ears, eat me, but you've got to catch this flight. Eat me, but you've got to catch this flight. So he had to decide if he would risk missing his flight to eat his chicken or if he would leave his too hot to eat chicken and catch his flight. And he says that he decided to take his chicken on the flight. And, and, and listen, listen, y'all, what God is saying to us is, is not to give up the chicken of religion, but he's saying don't miss the flight that God has for us. Don't miss the flight of love. Don't miss the flight of relationship. Don't miss the flight of being connected with me. Don't let what you do for God get in your way of your relationship with God. Don't let stuff, don't let people, don't let things, don't let objects, don't let this world, don't let idols, don't mix, don't max, don't miss, don't mix the connection, y'all. Don't mix it. Don't miss the connection, y'all. Don't miss what God has for you. Don't miss it. That's what God is saying in his life commandments. Don't miss it. Don't miss Jesus. That's essentially what he's saying. Don't miss Jesus. Don't miss Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your word today. Father, please help us to have none other than you. Help us, Lord, to have our priorities straight. Father, help us to let go of those things that we hold on to. Father, deliver us from the idols, the things, Lord, that does so easily distract us and take us away from you, O oh God. Father, we, we, we ask you to take us away and hide you. Hide us in you, Lord. Create quiet moments where we can hear your voice and hear your calling on our lives. God, we don't want to miss the flight of love. We don't want to miss the flight of salvation. We don't want to miss the flight of eternal life because we're caught up in things of this life. Deliver us, oh God. And those of us that have got stuff, Lord, I pray that you would begin to strip us now. Strip us, Lord, of our entertainment. Strip us, Lord, of, 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 of our joy. Strip us, Lord, of, of, of our um, strongholds. Strip us, Lord, of our addictions. Begin to strip us, Lord, of sports and entertainment. Be Lord, strip us of the things that just consume us that we cannot hear you. Father, I pray that now that we know better, you would help us to do better. There might be somebody under the sound of my voice who has heard this message today and says, I want to make my decision for you, Lord. I don't want to have none other. I don't want to miss my flight with you. I want to be saved. Today, I want to be baptized. Oh, I want to be rebaptized. Oh, I want to be involved in Bible studies. Would you drop that in the chat in Facebook? Would you drop that on YouTube? Would you do that right now? Just share that right now. Father, I pray that you would seal these commitments. And I pray, oh God, that those who have heard this message today will be on that flight to you with, to heaven and be with you when you come. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. And.